I am Boris and he's Radon. We usually hang out at the local hackerspace in Albania, which is a country in the Western Balkans. We have helped co-organize Open Source Conference Albania uh, for the previous editions. In 2017, we did our first crypto party together with Aryan Campus, and we managed to, with the help of the municipality of Tirana, publish on OpenStreetMap a lot of geographical data regarding the city of Tirana. We also help them migrate to Nextcloud, which is an open source solution for managing your files, and it's a solution they are using to this day. So before going into what our little project, uh, it's very important to give some context about, um, so it's a lot of different people here, so it's a bit important to also know the local context where we come from. Uh, apologies for the Albanian, but I will explain. These are news, news from uh, some articles that are related to, the, to this talk as well. So in 2009, we, in Albania, we had the first known data leak uh, that happened. And uh, what, uh, all the data from the uh, civil registry, which means names, surnames, IDs, they were leaked. And they are also, you can find them also today, unfortunately. And this was the first known case. We don't know if there are other cases as well. Um, and uh, basically, after this, in 2013, this was uh, between the changes of the government. We had election that, the elections that year. And what happened is that uh, people went to the central tax office in the physical servers. And they were caught on video. And uh, they stayed there for a night. They went out, and they, lots of data were deleted, which was pretty big. Uh, until this day, for both these cases, we don't know uh, if there are prosecutions in play people that are other than the IT specialists that were working there, unfortunately. And in 2016, another interesting case of uh, you know, not respecting the digital rights was uh, an MS catcher's uh, uh, hardware and software uh, package were sent to Albania from the Italian government to support the Ministry of Internal Affairs on uh, you know, how to do proper uh, surveillance in cases that the, the, pol the police needs to investigate. Uh, but what happened is that they, uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs kept the hardware uh, and all the, everything with it for one year. And uh, it was suspected that it was also used without any notification of anyone other than the Ministry of Internal Affairs at the time. And also this was a big scandal, but for us, unfortunately, it was very sad because uh, in, in the public discussion, this was not, uh, not debated at all. It was just a political issue, and nobody was talking about digital rights and how bad this was at the time. Uh, so we were frustrated that this was not uh, being discussed at the, at the time. And um, of course, the same uh, situation uh, happened in escalated in 2000, 2021. With yeah. more data leaks. Yeah, so ever since 2021, we've been getting a few more data leaks, and these ones have been far more comprehensive. Uh, the first example happened in April of 2021, where the data of 910,000 voters was exposed to the public. And we're talking stuff like social security number, your living address, your phone number, the license plate of your vehicle, and also later more data leaks came. So it's the one third of the population basically. Uh, because right. Albania has three million people, so approximately. And if you look at the collection of the data, it's pretty clear that these data are, have gotten out from governmental services. So in summer of 2021, uh, it turns out that one of the parties in Albania was using this data as a way to study, let's say, the voters and see how they can turn this into their advantage. So for each person who had a name, surname, all the ID, and some comments. For example, Redon, he is affiliated with our party, or he's not. If he's not affiliated with our party, we need to talk to him so that we, we change. So it was a proper dat database, but the data were from different governmental agencies in one, yeah. uh, which was pretty 
And this was the first time that the, the concern about digital rights was, went big uh, in Albania, which made us happy and sad at the same time for obvious reasons. Normally, the leak of such data, because you can't really change your social security number, for example, is that it really shocks you, and it takes some time for you to process what happened. However, what happened in Albania was, in summer 2021, these data came out, and then less than six months in December, our salaries became public. So all of the salaries of everybody who's working anywhere were now open for the entire public. And at least the data set was free. You could download it for free. So there's that. Uh, OK, you, yeah. you seem shocked. <laughs> OK. Uh, there is more. We have 10 more minutes, so no worries. <laughs> so in, in, my, in uh, May 2022, which is some months before, um, our government decided uh, pretty uh, fast that every governmental services, 95% of governmental services, will go through us governmental portal. So whatever you need as a paperwork, you have to go through there. Which is, might be a good idea or bad, but if you do it fast, things, bad things usually happen, as we all know. So for more context, a lot of the population in Albania is not very tech literate, and most of them don't have the tools to access this interface. So another phenomenon that usually happens is people go to internet cafes and ask people there to sign up their account which when we're talking about the account to interact with, with your government, that might not be the greatest idea out there. And, and also, it's not only this that people don't know how to use it. Uh, it's also that my, my parents, for example, they are old. My, my mom has a burner phone. It, last time it was charged, it was 2008, probably. And has no access. it's not a smartphone, so it has, it, it's very hard. So uh, everyone is trying to help their families to get into this. And because this went on very fast, it was launched very fast. Uh, last, like before us coming, coming here, one week or 10 days before, it was hacked. So until now, but hacked means nobody knows because there is not a proper report right now of how many data, how it, what happened, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what we do know is that our state was offline for, it was for two weeks. For two weeks. And uh, uh, the, when we were at the plane coming here, like uh, switching airports, um, they were, they were, the people that did this, they started leaking also whatever they have found gradually. So anyway, this is, sorry about this, but it's important to have uh, a lot of context. And uh, one last case, I will not talk about any breaches. Uh, we will not talk about any breaches anymore. So in 2009, it was introduced a law that said, it was a very vague law that said that the police has the right to, to do surveillance without any request to a prosecution, to a prosecutor, which in, in, in I don't, I'm not a legal person, but we, are, we, we know that it's anti-constitutional in the first case, so you need, there, there need to be checks and balances, right? So, the yeah. yeah, there tends to be a, a little pattern going on with how our digital rights are being respected. And he's into memes because he's younger than me. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm an Sorry. internet kid, so. So the, the public rhetoric always was, we don't know about this tech thing. Also journalists that we talked all the time, they said, we don't, we don't know, like it's very complicated to us, we don't understand. And also the, the general uh, argument from the governments, not only one, but in general, is that these things happen to every government, even the ones yeah. that we Thing that are more have more bigger budgets, they happen all the time. This was the first argument, and it still is today. And the second was, you've heard this before. Well, you have nothing to fear if you have nothing to hide. And uh, I, I'm not mentioning who started saying this first. See, uh, this saying is quite controversial, but I think it's kind of right because if the government has nothing to fear, they also should have nothing to hide. Well, what this means, as I mentioned before, the, the general the rhetoric is. It, this is okay, it's normal, it happens. And uh, we say, yes, okay, but we need to raise awareness about this. And uh, also, as Boris men mentioned, these things should apply. Transparency and be having nothing to hide should apply to the governments too. So we, we teamed up with a team of uh, uh, a group of people that are uh, uh, artists, a collective of artists, and they were, they were, they were doing this project called Manifesto uh, Hijacking. And 
the, 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 way, the, uh, the reason they mentioned this, uh, the hijacking there is because we want to change the rhetoric of the whole situation. So their collective, the collective is talking about other issues that are concerned in Albanian society, and our, our focus here is what's happened with surveillance and uh, the digital rights in Albania as well. So that's why we launched the nothingtohide.thebaticcenter.net, which is a, a, a map of mapping uh, points of surveillance in Albania, starting from Tirana. This is uh, yeah. The, the so map. this is Tirana right here, and if you see this little area right there, it has 62 cameras surveilling public area. So if you open one of them up, you can see more info on that. One important point: uh, we are not mapping all the cameras. We are only mapping cameras that are pointing in the public space. Uh, and these are business cameras because they, are, they, they need, by, the, by law, to have, uh, which is also a vague law, which says that you need to monitor your, your business if you are in the city center or anywhere else. Uh, but they don't specify that you need all, only to map your, your business, private area. Your, your, your property. So these are only cameras that are in the public, public area. And also, these are uh, done in, in a few amount of time, which means we're going to do this until September, right? The most outrageous thing I've seen so far, I was in, in the seaside. Uh, and uh, this is a, what's the name? It's a mole, like uh, it's a, in the, it goes in the sea, and it has this uh, wooden thing structure. that you walk. Structure. And uh, a, pro, a, a hotel that is really far away from this had put monitoring cameras there, and when asked around why this is happening, the answer was like, I don't know, because we can't, nobody told us that we cannot do this, right? So you go to the beach, the beach is public space by this definition. So if yeah. you go to OpenStreetMap, it's right there. And if you cannot see uh, from the distance, it's not just a camera, it's two and actually more. More that cameras are that go along the way. So that's a fun spot. And uh, so it's a combination of governmental practices going bad, but also not having awareness of what you need to respect in terms of you know, other people's privacy and digital space. So I'll go really quickly into the tech behind it. Uh, we are running Ushahidi, which is a platform for crowdsourcing data. So it was perfect for this fit. We are hosting in a very stable data center called My Bedroom. It's usually open nine to five. For the base map, we use OpenStreetMap, and we just render the additional points on top. For the license, we want to have this under public domain because it's crowdsourced data, but this might be tricky, so there is still discussion going on. Uh, one important thing about this is that we, after we launched this, two things happened. People started, uh, like we, we did some workshops in the city, uh, telling people how to do it. It's very easy. We're going to have some screenshots. Yep. You just take a photo, geolocation, and... Uh, so here is the form where you fill in the data. Yep. It's just geodata, a photo, and a short description. And, and uh, the, the idea is that we are tr trying to make it easy for people to do this, but going back to the public domain thing, we also, people were saying, oh, this is super nice, it's like Pokemon Go, which also is funny, but also very concerning at the same time, because it's, it's, uh, gamif we're, it's being gamified. Uh, but uh, we also got some researchers saying that, hey, we need, can, we, can you give us this data because we need to do some more research and also some people that know the context of the law so that we can have even more uh, outcomes out of this, right? So, yeah, this, this is the project. Yep. And Faleminderit, uh, as we say. Faleminderit. No, it's on time. Well, thank you so much. I'd never heard of this, and it's, well, it's not amazing. Obviously, it's awful, but <laughs> it's such an interesting subject, and you, I think it's amazing what you've done. Um, if there are any questions, there are mics in the middle. Oh, we're going to get questions? If you are comfortable okay. with that. We didn't do it. That's the answer for all the questions. We are not the ones to do it. No, I'm joking. No, they, did, <laughs> they didn't do anything. Like, what? Yeah, we're innocent. No, obviously not. Um, <laughs> they didn't do anything, just so you know. Um, well, thank you then. Okay. Thanks. And uh, another applause. No, if, if there are questions, oh. Uh, oh, I was ask. joking before. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I just Cultural heard. Cultural differences. Yeah, I just heard from an anonymous source that if there are questions, you can ask them. Okay. Yay! 
Thank you. Um, so when did you launch the app? Was that this year? Yeah, yep, yeah, that two, happened this two, year. Two, two months ago. Yeah. yeah. How popular did it get? So as of right now, we have around 100 data points. 96 100. of them are just in Tirana. Sorry, it's a, up to 106 right now. Last night it was 100, though. Uh, so, yeah. But it's, it, these are only, I think, from, from what we've observe, observed, these are only a few of them. And uh, until September, uh, we expect to have more people. What, what we're doing right now is doing some workshops so that people understand how they can contribute there. Uh, but we're expecting, based on what we see around, it, it, there are many, many more cameras that we can see, and not only in Tirana, in other cities in Albania as well. See, the thing when you start mapping here is you know there's a lot of public cameras around, but you never really think about how much there are and how much on the street you're on right now. So this project really helps. It helped me as well with putting that into perspective. Thank you. Great question. If there are any other questions? Yes. Oh, one more. Thank you for this talk. If you could um, lower the mic. Yeah. <clears throat> um, have, you, do, have you thought about maybe rolling this out in other cities, in other countries? Uh, I'm sure there will be quite some animus and enthusiasm uh, for it. I know, uh, I know in, my city, in my city I would like to replicate this. So uh, I, I know we, after we started this, we understood that there are also some other cities doing this. So New York has, uh, people in New York have done this. And in London, which I think that we know that is very, has lots of cameras. But if we are, we are once we do all the gathering of the, of the data in Tirana, we'll start documenting the process of how we can replicate this. Uh, because it's, but also it's very important to document the, uh, to have in, in on board, if you want to replicate this, to have on board also people that know about the local law context of what's happening. So again, we are in Albania. We are mo just monitoring cameras that are uh, monitoring public areas. That might not be lawful in whatever country or city you are living. So we will document this so that everybody can replicate it uh, after. Great, thanks. Hi, so two, two questions. First, have you thought about, I, I guess maybe, I don't know, depends on the trust that you have in government, for, for people to register, to have to register these cameras themselves so you can get like a public register that you can ask for. And the second thing is, um, there's companies like Ring that make private people do this. Right. Uh, are, are you also tracking those, well, Ring holes? Can or, I get the I first know, question? The sure. So, uh, for the first question, uh, okay, go, go to the second one because I want to... Okay, so in regards to the ring cameras, what we really want to map is just cameras that face public areas. So, for example, views of the street. The ring cameras, for example, are not popular in Albania at all. Uh, we have the manual version where you have to stand behind the door to see who's on the other side. So, we haven't come across that issue, but it's quite an interesting one. But again, it's about the, what the law says. So if you, are, if you can do it in your city or country, we shouldn't monitor it because it's part of the law, let's say, if you trust your government. But in our case, it's not. It's very vague. It's not, I, we don't understand what you can monitor or not, and we're trying to raise awareness with it. So even if it's a ring camera in your city, and it's your private property, as long as you're monitoring me passing as a pedestrian outside your door, that's shouldn't be the case because that's not allowed. It's also when you're, for instance, when you have a job where you have to go to, like you're the, 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 the newspaper boy, you're 16 years old, yeah. and you have to go to somebody's door and you get filmed. Right. In yeah. whatever state you are at 6 o'clock in the morning. I, I could personally object to that. I, uh, I wouldn't bring papers to such a person if I were a paper boy. Mm -hmm. but yeah, here in the Netherlands, it's actually illegal to film people in public spaces, I believe, without their permission. So cameras that are on public street, you can't, you can, if you have a personal camera, you can only do it on your personal property. So let's say I have a house I want to protect with a camera. I can't put it at the front of my garden and film the entire street. I can only film my garden and my front door. Exactly, but one of the problems is that, for instance, if you're a 16 year old paper boy, you actually have to subject yourself to this 
without permission because you are going on the person's premises. You get filmed, you get sent to don't know which data center, and you cannot approve or disapprove. And the same goes for people that are in their in a, a official capacity. So people visiting your house and being able to film that actually has boundaries that are treading on other people's rights. Yep. And, and if the door is facing the street, yep. then, then, then all bets are that, off. And that's why these things are very important because we feel, again, we have the local context of Albania. We think that digital literacy is a very, a very low point, a very low in, in, at the worldwide level. So people don't, what we're discussing right now, they don't understand that this is important or whatever. And that's why we, we, we all need to do more uh, about explaining uh, why this is okay or it's not okay. Like putting things into perspective, perspective, just like, for example, this shows how surveilled you are at the moment. Regarding your first question, quick answer. Uh, it seems like we don't trust the government uh, where we live. Uh, the thing is that we just want it to work properly. That's nothing against them. Uh, but they are now introducing a law that, that, makes, that will put all the cameras from, business, from businesses to in one directory, so which is very basically bad. store everything. That so goes the government on. will have access, immediate access to all the cameras. That are, which, first of all, is important, impossible technically, because you need the, all the cameras have different software and setup, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the second, only the thought of it, it's like cringy, right? But and and that's that's uh, that's very the, the police should go after the bad people the bad guys but we right now we have no after all the cases that we have shown we have no indication that the data are handled properly and we had more time we can go on and have more cases where the data in Albania are not handled properly by government officials so it's not about as I mentioned before we don't we don't have anything about trusting but we have all the indications in the world that they either don't know what they're doing or they're doing this on purpose, or even worse, the combination of both. And there is another is... factor on top of that, which is we don't have an indication that the government knows where these cameras are either. So really, the only option to go forward will be to crowdsource that data. So we allow people to submit either anonymously or with their profile, because we want to respect their right. But it seems like there is no other way to have such information. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Then another big applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Then the next speaker, I don't know if he's here, his name is Matthew. Ah, there you are. Well, I, I came in a little late because I thought it was a two, it was at one, so it was like running. That's why I have a fork in my pocket. Um, I was eaten. <laughs> so I asked, like, what is it about? And I didn't really understand. But that actually made me super excited for the talk. Because now I have no idea yet what it's about, and the more I can learn. So I believe it's about software. Is that correct, Matthew? Yeah. Yes. Whew, I know something. Um, but he's going to tell so much more about it. So give a big applause for Matthew and his talk. Are you ready? Or should I? I just heard that they're still setting something up. So in the meantime, we're going to play a little game I heard of yesterday. So I need you for that. So everyone, everyone's attention. Yeah, great, thank you. So this is how the game goes. I start with the number one, and then someone yells two, then someone else yells three. But you can't um, say a number at the same time. So if I say one, someone else can say one as well. Any questions? Okay, so one. Again. Three. No, no, we need to start at one. <laughs> one. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Oh. <laughs> okay, one, uh, one last time. And I, will you be ready to go then? Almost. Almost, okay. One. Oh. <laughs> one. You should always start at zero. Uh, <laughs> zero. Oh. <laughs> okay, he's ready. Well, thank you, and a big applause for Matthew. So, who here has heard of Docker? Wow, that's amazing. I thought I was going to have to explain what Docker is, but you all know what it is, right? 
Great. So this talk is called useflake.nix, not Dockerfile. This is, I don't know, I'm preaching to the choir. Maybe you know what the issues are with building software with Docker. Maybe you don't. But I'm going to try and explain why it's not really that reproducible and why you can use Nix instead. So why use Dockerfiles? Well, I don't know. But why use flake.nix? Because builds via Docker files aren't reproducible, but they are repeatable. So that means that you, know, you can run the same instructions, but it does not mean that you'll get the same result. So what is Nix? Nix is an expression language. It's a domain-specific language, which was invented by Elko Dolstra in his PhD thesis in 2003. Um, it's lazily evaluated which means it's more performant for doing package management. It's a purely functional programming language, which means it's not procedural. So the order in which you define things does not matter. It's declarative rather than imperative, so things are defined as a expression rather than as a sequence of events that you want to occur, much like in a Docker file. And yeah, in that, in that way, everything is an expression, and there are no side effects. So here's a basic abstract example. This is called an attribute set. Uh, in this example, x is equal to a list, which has a string inside of it, y. Uh, y is equal to 1, and z is equal to the expression 1 plus 1. So let's uh, evaluate what x would have been. So x is a string, uh, y inside of a list. And the same for y, it's just 1. And z is 1 plus 1, which is 2. So here's a basic concrete example of me compiling Hello World from GNU source code. So I'm going to cat the examples, hello world.nix. This is the Nix expression, which defines how to compile this software. And then I'm going to Nix build it. I'm going to look at the result that it creates. The result is a symlink to this object store called slash Nix slash store, where the immutable software packages live. All right? Um, we can see that it's a dynamically linked x86 executable with its interpreter patched to uh, the correct interpreter. And then I run it at the end, so you see hello world is there. So what is the expression at the top where it says let packages import Nix packages, et cetera? So that is a function call to standard env.mk derivation. The first argument is name, which is a string. So I'm going to call this package hello world. And the source code is going to come from uh, GNU's FTP server. And we're going to hash this, and this is really important. We're going to say what the SHA-256 sum is ahead of time. Now this way, if anyone else uh, sees the expression in the future and they build it, and that tarball has changed. Well, we'll know about it because the SHA-256 won't match. So this data is really important for reproducibility and security. So by comparison, let's see what a Docker file would look like. So from Ubuntu latest, there's two problems here, right? Ubuntu, even if we could find the original Docker files for Ubuntu, could we reproduce it? Or do they have many steps inside of it that aren't reproducible? Like apt install this, apt install that. Because every time you do apt install, you've lost the reproducibility because it's going to give you a different result the next time it runs. Latest, latest when? When I run the Docker build. Right? Uh, so the, the Docker files are not intrinsically attached to their, to their results. So the result of a Docker file is basically like a binary. You give that binary to people, and you'll, you may never see the Docker file ever again. Right? And that's not quite true for Nix expressions. Uh, so apt-get update, it's going to resolve a different package list uh, the next time it runs. So the next time I run Docker build, hello might just not be there. So we're going to have to run it five times, and then hopefully uh, Debian servers are, uh, are up again rather than down. And yeah, but that's not, that's not the only problem. Every time we do apt-get install, hello, it's going to create a package database, and this package database is going to have timestamps in it. There's going to be tons of reproducibility issues just at every level in this Docker file. And then the last offender is CMD hello. This assumes that the hello package actually puts a binary called hello on the path. So maybe hello is not the name. Maybe it's hello-world. So there's nothing but assumptions in this Docker file. And indeed, if we use this method here, where we save the result of building it into a tarball, and then we look at the tarball, the tarball is different. Now, this isn't the full story. This is a bit of a cheat, right? As a matter of fact, if you extract this, you'll get another tarball, and inside of that is a layer and a file system hierarchy, like slash user slash bin, etc. 
So um, we'd have to inspect that with Diffoscope to understand the true reason that this is not reproducible. But I mean, this, this uh, is a nice example because it shows that, you know, even when they package the tarball for the OCI image, this tarball, this image that we're going to load into Docker, even that step is not necessarily reproducible because tarballs pack and unpack, uh, serialize and deserialize in a different order every time operations are performed. So how do we do this with a Nix flake instead? So there's a function someone made called, I, didn't, I only wrote this presentation this morning, so I missed that out, but it's called um, Docker Tools Build Layered Image. Right? So someone in Nix packages, which is a, uh, is a library of 80,000 software packages and Nix expressions and functions and things, um, so they, they made this, this uh, function called build layered image. And this is essentially a reproducible bash script for producing container images. Right? So my container image equals running that function with the first argument name, my container image, the tag, uh, latest. Contents is a list of things that I want to be in the container. And config.cmd is the entry point that we saw in the Docker file earlier, which was hello. So uh, let's just have a look here. So th this hello here, that's what we're going to map to in the Nix expression, config.command equals hello. So this is the first thing it's going to run when the container boots. So uh, this is in a data structure called a flake. So a flake has inputs and outputs. We say inputs.nixpackages.url equals this GitHub repo. And whenever we run a Nix command on this, it's actually going to generate a flake.lock. Uh, so I'd just like to show you that before I get too far in. So flake.lock. So we no longer have that problem of like latest being latest when I run the command, because it creates a lock file and tells you what it was when I ran the command. And this is immutable and stored in the Git repo where I provide these expressions or uh, tell you to run it from. So yeah, let's, uh, let's build it. So we're going to build my container image. We're going to look in the result. Then we're going to load that result into Docker. And then we're going to run it with Docker. And this has all been done. Like The container image has been built with Nix reproducibly. And then ran with Docker. So I'm just going to run that. Oh dear. Ah, there we go. <laughs> So I got scared there for a moment. OK, so it created a result, put it in the Nix store where it lives uh, reproducibly, and it loaded it into Docker, and then it ran it. So there you go, much more reproducible than the, than the Docker file. right? So why is this the case? So Docker is repeatable but not reproducible. It defines instructions, but it trusts the internet unconditionally, and it doesn't perform any hashing, or at least it doesn't encourage people to do that. Uh, Docker files do not provide you with a tool set for performing reproducible builds, and Nix is basically a, uh, a C++ binary written by Elko Dolstra, which implements the Nix expression language, which gives you a tool set for implementing reproducible builds. So what does Nix guarantee? So it guarantees that we're going to get the same inputs from the internet every time, and we're going to perform the build process inside of a sandbox, and hopefully the result is deterministic. Uh, it, gar it guarantees that, but it does not guarantee that the build process, in fact, is deterministic. An example of this would be the Java compiler. The Java compiler will put timestamps into every jar file that it creates, every piece of Java source code. Now, of course, we're not going to get rid of the system call that allows the process to gather the time at this point in time. Um, but uh, that, that, was, that was a decision because it, it built, it, sorry, it, um, it broke a lot of build processes. So instead, we have to do things like touch 1970 at every build step so that we get rid of the timestamp and the intermediate steps when we compile things. Um, so yeah, there's lots of reasons that a build may not be deterministic, and Nix can't help with that. But what it can do is perform the same build with the same inputs every single time and hope that the output's deterministic, which is a lot more than, than many other tools can do. So uh, do I have any extra time? Do I have... Uh... <laughs> yes, we have enough time for questions. Oh, yeah, I didn't want to go to questions straight away. I just wanted to show uh, three really cool things. So Nix Shell is a way of trying things before you buy. So I'm going to SSH into my server because the internet here might just drop out. Um, so I'm going to Nix build, oh, sorry, Nix Shell, Nix packages, hashtag, I don't know, Python 3. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I have Python 3 now. But if I get out of the Python 3 interpreter, 
and try and run Python 3 again after exiting out of this temporary shell. I don't have Python 3. I don't have Python on any of my systems installed globally, right? It's just I, I install it when I need it and only when it's necessary. Now, because it's an expression language, if I go into the REPL, I can say something like, let's load Nix packages. And then Python 3 has a member function inside of it with packages. And I can say, inside of P, put all of the whatever it is, 20,000 Python libraries that exist in the world from PyPy. And I'm going to give it a list of Python libraries that I want for this particular instance of Python. P dot, I don't know, NumPy. It's going to evaluate that and create a derivation. And then I'm going to build that derivation. And it's going to do all of this reproducibly. So if you, you know, evaluated this expression, you get the same path. You get the same output path on your machine. And then I can ls in there and see that we've got bin and we've got Python interpreter. And if we run that, we'll have a Python 3 that can import NumPy. Oh. But if I exit this and exit again, you know, I don't have Python anymore. We go into a Nix REPL and say I want Python 3. Oop, got to load Nix packages. I'm going to build Python 3. Note that I'm not defining a function. I just want Python 3. I don't want Python 3 with NumPy. Let's take a look in the output. This Python cannot import NumPy because there is no such thing. It's not global. There is no global state. There's no global thing that's being modified. Everything is a copy every single time uh, with something added or without something added. Um, another thing that you can do is you can cross-compile using Nix. So in Nix packages, there is a package set called packages cross, which is all of the 80,000 Nix packages that you can get. Um, whoops. Yeah, so like, I don't know. Python's there. We've got um, NumPy, and we've got um, Firefox, and we've got you know a set of 80,000 packages, which we can do what we want with. So what do we want to cross-compile all those 80,000 packages? Well, Packages Cross has in it, if we tab complete, all of the architectures we want. So let's say Risk v 64-bit, and then, I don't know, Hello World. Now, I think I've done this, and this is another benefit of reproducible builds, is that things are cached. I did this last month. It puts something in my slash Nix slash door. It's still there. It's not going away. I haven't garbage collected it yet, and that's another concept that Nix has is garbage collection. The file system is memory, is what they call it in the thesis. So um, I, I did this last month, so it's still there. So that's why I completed. But if I want to rebuild it just to show off, it can do this. And this is reproducibly cross-compiling Hello World for RISC V 64-bit. And it's done. And in slash bin, we have a dynamically linked RISC-5 binary. And the fun part is, despite the fact that I'm actually running on an x86 kernel, I can still, I can still actually execute this because I have something called bin FMT registrations enabled on my system. And the way that that's done is also very easy, um, thanks to Nix, because Nix OS, of course, has many options. And I can just say, OK. Uh, bin FMT registrations. Yeah, I want to be able to run um, Windows binaries or ARM binaries. I can do that on my x86 system just by putting a list of emulated systems in this option. So that, that, that should um, convince you to use Nix, if, Nix OS if, if nothing else does. Um, yeah, I think I just uh, showed off those three points. So uh, any questions if I have time? If not, uh, then that's my talk. Yeah, if there are any questions, the mics are still in the middle. Uh, if you walk the mic, otherwise the video doesn't have audio, so we all can hear you, but the people re-watching can't. Well, in Dockerfile, you have a latest. Step a little bit closer um, to the mic, please. Yeah, thank in you. In Dockerfiles, you have latest, and that's great. You don't have to upgrade it in half a year. Uh, is there something like a Nix? Maybe specify, well, latest up to this timestamp? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, Docker could, if it wanted to, probably like implement a lock file, um, although I, I haven't seen that. So, so the benefit of Nix here, right, is that you can't do such a thing as latest. It doesn't exist. And that's a good thing for reproducibility. So if we take a look at this Docker file, right, it says latest. Uh, now, there's no, there's no, when you run the command, it's going to go and fetch the latest. 
and everyone that runs the Docker build command, every single person on the planet will get a very different result. Right? There is no guarantee. So I have to tag it, I have to say like 2004, right? but that 2004 could still change technically. If I want it to be really reproducible, and Docker does do this, you can specify a hash. Right? And so, so you know, there is a way around that, but it's the, it's the least of Docker's issues. Right? So this is just one. No, is one well, well, the question would be, is there a next upgrade? Uh, yes, indeed. So let's say flake.lock, flake.nix here has um, nix was 20, 2205. This is a tag, right? So it changes. So if I want to see what that is, I go into the flake.lock and we see that indeed it's the E3583 uh, revision of nix packages. Oops. And if I go to nix packages on GitHub and I go to that, a hash. Uh, what I'm saying, it's a lot of steps to keep your system up to date. Uh, no, it's, it's not. I'm just showing you the full path as to how it's reproducible. So if we go to that commit, we'll see that that commit exists. And this commit was made a few days ago, you know, four days ago. So in four days, you know, a lot might have happened. So we want to go on and we want to advance from this hash, this revision here. So all we have to do is next lake uh, update. And it will go and find what the latest hash is. Looks like D1CA4EA, right? And so this is the step that you do to update the lock file. Um, and once that's done, uh, right now it's extra it actually went and fetched the latest Nix packages and it's extracting the tarball on my laptop. So it's a bit slow because my laptop disk is a bit slow. But, um, okay. but that lock file will be uh, yeah, updated. Fine. That was great. Yeah. Okay, I think we need to be rounding up the questions. Do we have time for one more? Or should we? Yeah, we've got one more speaker, so if you, the other questions, I think they can approach you yeah. afterwards because we really got to move it along. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have a question, but one sentence. If you go to repology.org, you will find of all the distros on the planet, all their versions, and you will find that Nix Packages has the most recent of any distro. Beats the pants of anything. Top right, Nix Packages Unstable. It's the most uh, fresh. It's the largest size, so it's got more packages than Arch. They're fresher than Arch, they're more up-to-date than Arch, they're more maintained than a lot of other distributions, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so for the next speaker, um, I learned what his subject was, and I was like, I know nothing about that. Because his, uh, his speech or talk is on the good old times. I wasn't born during those. I'm 15. I'm way too young for that. So I'm really, uh, I'm really looking forward to hear what you, your generation, oh, I, it'll be nice, what he has to say about the good old times. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, yeah, this is going to be completely ad lib. Uh, I didn't know I was going to do a talk until, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes ago. Uh, so I'll just make it up completely. Oh, there's no time as well, so you'll just have to flag me because <laughs> to keep track of the time. I don't know where to start, but I will start when I will start from the point when I went over to the retro tent, and uh, I was with some people, and they asked me about uh, the machines there, and some were I was I was familiar with uh, the in particular the Amiga, the Commodore Amiga computer, <laughs> and. Uh, it took me back to when, uh, I, well, I suppose I lived through the 80s, but not the 70s. I missed the 70s. And uh, the, uh, my, my first computer was a green monitor computer, uh, an 8-bit Commodore PET. And uh, then my family got uh, an Amstrad CPC that, that had color and I could load games. I think my friends had games from cassette. And... Uh, after which then my third computer was the Amiga 500 and I, uh, I absolutely loved it. And it could do things that you just could not do on, uh, on other systems at the time. So uh, they, they, even basic concepts like what, um, how, how would it connect to the internet? Uh, and where would the internet run if I, if I booted it up and tried to use the internet? What did the internet look like back then? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I wasn't on it, but I'd read articles in magazines. And the way we got software for the computer was just simply we could buy magazines or we could wait until we saved enough to uh, go and, go and uh, buy, buy some software from the uh, I don't know, um, Smiths or wherever the, wherever the sales were at the time, or even mail order. And one popular thing we used to do was order software from uh, 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 magazines where they would list like one pound per disc or... Uh, yeah, or alternatives as well. 
Um, so, yeah, before we had the internet, before my, a lot of my friends got uh, uh, maybe a computer with Windows um, in, in, uh, in, in the mid-90s, uh, people still had modems, and they could dial up into uh, uh, they could they could dial other machines that also had a, a modem on the phone line. So you couldn't tell the computer where to go, and the computer would it be able to automatically uh, route its way to its destination. You had to manually dial the number and uh, add, add, and download packages off uh, or, or files, and you had the limitations of the size of the floppy disk, so you had to split. If maybe your form, your disk format wasn't big enough to contain the file, you had to split it up into into pieces. Um, and just out of interest, how many of you had uh, an 8-bit micro back in the day? Uh, no, no one, no one had an 8-bit micro back in the day. 16-bit uh, micro. Uh, get, uh, eight, uh, early games console, no. So, yeah, what's that? MSX Basic. M MSX Basic, excellent, nice. Uh, so, someone else shouted. Yeah, the bench was yeah I'd, I'd say earliest. Yeah, uh, the 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 the, er, the earliest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was it was interesting times, and I think a lot of things were taken for granted, like how long things took, but um, I. I'd, when I look back now and I see the machines in the in the retro tent, a lot of them have been upgraded. They have SD cards, so you can load almost any package from uh, that ever existed is on that one SD card because of, it's scaled up. It's been scaled up so vastly, uh, and the packages are now tiny in comparison. And um, it. it it really put things into perspective. I'd occasionally, I look back and I'll run an emulator and I'll, um, I'll, I'll forget how difficult things were and tricky. And I'll, <laughs> I'll forget, um, I might forget, oh, it really did take that long. Oh, it didn't seem, you know, I mean, it wasn't such a big deal putting a cassette, load, loading your game in from cassette or floppy disk, but yeah. It, We've got it really cushy these days. We've got it really easy. We don't realize how convenient it is to have the facilities we've got on disk. I didn't have a, disk, a hard disk drive, so a lot of things ran off ROM or from, from floppy disk. Um, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was good memory trip. Uh, I, I, it must be still up. I don't know if they're dismantling it. Yeah, it'll be still up. Retro tent. So get, yeah, give a get, have a good look at all the machines on in that retro tent and uh, yeah, ask around. There's going to be some some guys that had old systems. I'd love to talk about those things and uh, just enjoy them as much as I did. Uh, got me interested. I was interested from just a hobbyist perspective because I liked calculators and I thought and they were very simple devices. Um, Bit more than a glorified calculator, bit less than a uh, uh, 3D graphics rendering engine. So, <laughs> PlayStations came out in 95-ish, something like that. Is that right? No, it was a bit earlier than that. I think it was 92, 93. Uh, yeah, it all just went to uh, PC. So yeah, definitely, definitely check out the retro tent. Um, yeah, good times for me, and uh, yeah, have fun. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Ah, it works. Well, thank you. I learned a lot because I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> and it's really, really, I, it surprised me. My dad talks about it sometimes. It still, oh, there goes my fork. Uh, it still surprises me how far we've come in such a short time, like 20 years ago. And now, it's, I, yesterday I walked through an entire different world while shooting robots. And 20 years ago, my dad was like loading a file and it would take an hour. So it's amazing. And you talk about it really lovely. Now, uh, there's a question, so uh, fire it on. Hiya, that was cool. Thank you. Do you still have, like, cassettes or floppies? Um, yeah, we had an M6 Basics, and it loaded things of cassettes, and I remember having to reload games because the cassette would be a bit stuck. Have you had any issues with that, too? Do you remember anything? That's right. Uh, that, that did happen. Some of the reasons... Well, one of the, one of the common reasons for that... Well, uh, there was a few could be that the tape head, I, I, I have experienced it, the tape head can become clogged over time. I, well, I, I, you get these cassettes that like cleaner head cassette tapes, but I would 
just simply get sim get some get a little drop of isopropyl alcohol on a Q-tip and just rub the head, and that 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 cleans it up nicely. It dries out quickly. So if you just want a quick fix to that, that's one try. Another try is well, a slightly uh, <coughs> trickier one is the head alignment. There is a screw, and you can get calibration tapes where you can align the head, and you need to maybe I don't know. Do you need an oscilloscope? I don't. Yeah. So you'd need to have a way of. Um, but yeah, balancing that head. So that, there, there's a few a few ways, and then you be, should might even be able to load the tapes in and archive some. If they don't exist on the internet, you might be able to uh, contribute to the archive. <laughs> you might have some rare tapes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The the last question for now, and then I assume they can uh, ask yeah. any other uh, things. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a question. Just wanted to mention my my story about this. So. Uh, yeah, it's a question actually. So, have you did you also exchange cassettes with your friend, like Game Boy cassettes or even console cassettes? Because I was living in a block apartment, and we were because we couldn't afford each one of us like we were ten friends. We couldn't afford each one of us to buy all the cassettes we wanted. So one month, one of us bought one, and we exchanged it. And it was also a, a, a game like you you were very good if you finished the game first and you could go and in your face everyone. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is one of the first. Uh, the second I want to say is that I have a story with my dad. Uh, he came. I remember this very clearly. He came in my. In I was playing uh, a game, and actually, what happened is that he said, "Did you do your homework?" I said, "Yes." He said, "Did you clean up your room?" He said, "Yes." So your mom wanted help. Did you? I said, "Yes, I did it." Okay, now go out because I want to play. I'm your father. So <laughs> <laughs> he, he ran out of excuses. I just wanted to share because. Yeah, it, it, yeah, all these, all these good old very Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, well, we yeah, we did um, we did share some uh, discs that were um, a lot of the time you get free games off the magazines. Maybe we couldn't even buy the game, so we'd all get the cover discs and the cover discs for that. You, sometimes they'd have a full game. Sometimes they had PD games. Sometimes they'd have different types of games. And some friends, if they were lucky enough to have modems, I didn't actually have a cassette player, but my friends did. I had a, I was, I was. Uh, uh, spoiled. I had a disk drive, <laughs> so, uh, so. But but even the disk drives as well. People would uh, if they if they were lucky as well to have a modem, which I didn't have. They could get onto the bulletin boards and get software from them. And yeah. Was... Well, well, you mentioned that is uh, everything. You mentioned that is everything was slow. But I think doing these exchanges was a very nice way of socializing and getting new friends. And it was like a social network. Yeah. Oh, they would leave their the name in, in the in the in the yes. intro. Yes. And it would uh, <laughs> a scroller, a text scroller, and it'll put the put the number. Oh, that's yeah, that's good. That's amazing. Good. I loved hearing the stories, and it's so funny because I remember when I was a little smaller that we had a Wii, and obviously that's way more advanced. But um, we had to like uh, this thing got stuck, and then you had to take it out and um, blow on the CD to clear off all the dust, and then only then it will work. <laughs> Which was uh, one of my like earliest tech memories that we were like, it just <laughs> to make it work. But it's it really like, nice to hear. Back in the day when they had Nintendo NES, you do the same with the cartridge. It was famous, so people just go like, yeah. like, an, like a harmonica. <laughs> yeah. Well, another big applause for. Uh, for Thank you. And then that is marks the end of the lightning talks. I want to thank all of you. Um, and this is my last shift as a herald, so I really enjoyed having you as a public. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yay. And uh, I hope to see you all in three years at the next uh, event. Bye-bye. Yay. Hmm? That also, I don't know if I'm going, but yeah. And also a big, big thanks to the organizer of all the lightning talks. <laughs>